with the left, with the right, knock him out, knock him out, knock him out for the night. One chance, knock him out. Two, two, two times, knock him out, knock him out, knock him out for the night. Good morning. I was 34 years old, and I had a very good life. I, was a, uh, I had a great home, uh, a loving wife, two beautiful children. I had a great job. I was a captain with the New York City Department of Correction working in this prestigious unit. And I found myself wondering, why was I in this room, looking out the window, watching cars go back and forth? There was a knock on the door. I turned around. The doctor walked into the room and told me that I had lymphoma. And he pointed to the jersey I was wearing. I was wearing a Mario Lemieux uh, Pittsburgh Penguins jersey, and he said, you have uh, lymphoma, just like him. And so my first thought was, was I going to see my children, my two boys, graduate from grammar school? And so he told me that I was going to have to go through several uh, tests to determine whether I had Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And after those tests were completed, I undergone uh, several months of chemotherapy. And after that, I underwent some uh, radiation. And radiation actually had to be stopped, uh, postponed temporarily, because the mass, I had a 9.3 centimeter mass in my chest. I had uh, cancer in my throat, and I had cancer in my lymph nodes underneath my armpits. And I couldn't swallow from the radiation. But after I got through the battle of uh, my lymphoma, I thought I had a new, new lease on life, and I was going to move on and do something great. And for the next five years, my doctor would always have me go for a, a, a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. But on year six, she said to me, you know what, I want you to go for a PET scan. And PET scans were relatively new back then. And so I went for the PET scan, and two days later, I noticed that I was jaundiced. My eyes were yellow. My urine was the color of actually uh, Coca-Cola. And so on the third day, I started drinking a lot of water that day because I thought maybe I didn't drink enough water to flush out what they had introduced into my system when they were doing a PET scan. So I drank a lot of water. The next day, it still continued, and I said, you know what, I should call the doctors. But before I could call the doctors, my phone rang, and it was the doctor. And she said that they had discovered a mass on the head of my pancreas, a tumor, and that I had pancreatic carcinoma. My next thought was, now I'm not going to be able to see my boys graduate from high school. And so she said there would be several other tests before actually um, they can make a true determination. So I went for a second and third opinion. I went to a hospital in New York City. I went to a hospital here on Long Island. And finally it was determined that I did have pancreatic carcinoma and a, a surgical procedure called a Whipple procedure would be needed to help alleviate my pain and possibly this tumor. And so leading up to the days up to the surgery, you know, because of the high probability of not surviving either the surgery or pancreatic carcinoma, I kind of prepared my family for my demise. I talked to them. I spent as much time as possible. You know, I was someone that was a workaholic, and I realized now that my family needed me, my, my presence, more than they needed the money that I was bringing in at the time. The day of the surgery, I'll never forget, it seemed like, it wasn't going to go right. When I went in for them to put the IV in my arm, I realized that they used a uh, nurse practitioner, they had a phlebotomist, they had a doctor, and no one can get a line because my veins were compromised because of the previous chemotherapy I had received. Ultimately, they did, and as they wheeled me on the gurney into the elevator to bring me up to the surgical suite, I looked at my parents and, and my wife at the time, and possibly saying I love you to them for the last time. They wheeled me up into surgery. Ten and a half hours later, I was out of surgery. I was in surgical intensive care. Three days later, I was in ICU. They discharged me. They told me that they had removed all of the cancer, and I was going to be OK. Six weeks later, the jaundice is back. The urine discoloration is back. And I'm back at the doctor's. The doctor now tells me that I have a disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis. And Walter Payton, a Hall of Fame football player, had passed away from this illness. And now I'm wondering, how does someone who six weeks earlier was diagnosed with pancreatic carcinoma is now diagnosed with this disease that I've never heard of before, primary sclerosing cholangitis? 
My family was upset because the doctors did not have the courtesy of even having my friends or a family member there to tell me this illness. And so they inserted a biliary catheter in my side and discharged me as I waited for a liver transplant consultation that actually talked to the providers of my medical coverage to see what was covered. But a week and a half later, I started getting sick again. And now I'm down to 135 pounds. 135 pounds from a guy that was 240 pounds. And I was rushed to the hospital, and they realized that the catheter was inserted incorrectly. So the bile was pooling in my abdomen. I had developed MRSA, peritonitis, a staph infection. I had pneumonia, 103 fever. They had to reinsert the catheter. They had to aspirate my lung because my left lung had collapsed. And so that was in the ER. And as they brought me up into the room almost 12.30 at night, my parents and my then wife again are there. And I'm so out of it, I say to them, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I was out of my mind. I didn't know what was going on. And I went to sleep that night. And I had a dream. I was at a table. And my great-grandfather and grandfather, who had passed on, we're at this table, and my father, who's still alive, thank goodness, was there, and he's saying, Errol, talk to them. And I firmly believe right now that if I would have said hello to them, I would have been saying goodbye to the people here on Earth. So I had to see an infectious disease doctor who put a pick line in my left arm. I went home with all this medication because my family now had to be my health care providers. My son would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning before he went to school to take the vancomycin, which is the antibiotic outside, out of the refrigerator. And then he would let it get to room temperature because if he would have just connected it right to my IV right then and there, it would have just been too cold for my veins. My wife at the time would then uh, not only give the vancomycin at 6 o'clock p.m., but she would also flush that drainage bag for me. And I started getting better. And I remember one day I was sitting in my den, and it was a little crack in the blinds, and there was a ray of light coming through. And through that light was the trees in the backyard. And I remember saying to myself, praying to God, that if I got an opportunity to recover from this, I promise I'd try and do something great with my life. And I recovered, luckily. I recovered from that again. And so I was living in several boxes. I was in a box where I was a lymphoma patient. And then another box where I was a lymphoma survivor. And then I was in another box. I was a pancreatic cancer patient. And then in another box, I was a lymphoma, uh, pancreatic cancer survivor. And so with that, three years later, I'm having difficulty breathing one day, and I'm thrashing around in the bed, really having a difficult time gasping for air. Luckily, a friend of mine was a physician had come over to see my wife, my then wife at the time, and my wife said, you should look at Errol. He's not looking too well. And she had a stethoscope around her neck, and she started listening to my lung sounds. She noticed my nail beds were blue and said I was cyanotic. She put me in her car, and we raced to the hospital. And as we were, she was driving as fast as she can through traffic to get to the hospital. I hear her talking to the hospital, telling them my symptoms. When I got into the hospital, there was a cardiac surgeon waiting for me. And he said to me, you have a cardiac tamponade. And for those that don't know what a cardiac tamponade is, you know, our hearts normally pump like this. With a cardiac tamponade, the fluid the in the pericardial sac prevents your heart from beating properly. So they had to put a window in my heart. And I was told as they wheeled me in that I was given last rites. And for several days after the surgery, I had this tube coming out of my chest. And I had this, this box that I would carry around. I would move the IV and carry this box because it was draining the fluid from my heart. Then again, I was able to survive that and move on. And then one of the most tragic things that I can say that has occurred to me, I was at work one day, and I was reached out to my wife. She had a chronic illness and was really suffering, and I reached out to see how her day was doing. She had to stop working, and she didn't answer, but my job was getting so, it was so busy that day, that I didn't have an opportunity to follow up. And I realized later in the day, she had never responded. So I tried again. I called and I texted. Couldn't get in touch with her. So I asked my future daughter-in-law, can you stop by the house and see if she's OK? 
My daughter-in-law called me up and she said, no one's answering the door. So I raced home. I entered the house. I started calling her name as I walked through each room. I went upstairs. I was hoping she had went to sleep and was just in a deep sleep. She was not in our bed. I went to the master bathroom. And as I opened, just before I opened up the door, I called her name one last time. And I opened up the door and she was gone. And it was the most difficult thing that I realized that now I have to tell my two sons that their mother is not here anymore. And I tell you all this because I've been in many different boxes in my life. I was in a new box now as a widower. And so with all of that that I have gone through, I was able to go back to school and I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, a postgraduate degree, a doctorate in education from Dowling College and then ultimately went to Harvard for executive leadership. My professional career, I was a correction captain, as I told you earlier. I went on to be the assistant deputy county executive for public safety here in Suffolk County. Eventually went back to New York City as the deputy commissioner of operations. And then in 2017, elected as the 67th and first African-American sheriff in the history of Suffolk County. I play hockey two to three times a week. And I found love. I am remarried. And I, I, I tell a story not to, not to receive accolades for myself. You know, there are a lot of people out there that know individuals who are suffering with some sort of illness, whether it is cancer, whether it is a cardiac tamponade, whether it is primary sclerosis and cholangitis. And you can get through these illnesses. You need a strong support system. You need good health care providers. You need people who will encourage you, somebody that will it will lift you up that one moment when you feel like you're in that, that dark, dark space. And so I lived in many boxes, many, many dark boxes. And now I can tell you that I'm living in the light of every good box that I could find. And this isn't the last that you will hear from Errol Toulon Jr. Thank you very much. <laughs> One time's 